Welcome, investors, to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. On today's podcast, we welcome special guest, GetAround founder and CEO, Sam Zaid. GetAround is the world's leading fully digital and global sharing marketplace. On the show, Sam discusses his entrepreneurial journey from Ottawa to San Francisco, the main benefits of car sharing for both hosts and guests, what it's like being a soft bank portfolio company, his favorite productivity hack, and more. Point of disclosure, the Accelerate Arbitrage Fund ETF does hold shares and warrants in Interprivate 2 acquisition, the SPAC that is merging with GetAround. So with no further ado, here's our show on car sharing and entrepreneurship with GetAround CEO, Sam Zaid. Welcoming Sam from GetAround to the show today, calling in from San Francisco. Sam, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Julian. How are you doing? Not too bad. How's the weather in San Francisco these days? You know, it's summer in San Francisco. I think it's it's you know it's what uh, the coldest part of the year every year. <laughs> Perfect. So I want to kick things off. Getting into your background now, prior to starting Get Around uh, a while back, over ten years ago, you founded a couple other startups in Ottawa, Canada. How was the experience of launching a startup in Ottawa versus San Francisco, and and ultimately what? led you to kick off get around um in california <clears throat> yeah that's a, a long time ago now um yeah but i think you know founding a couple startups in ottawa you know it's really a fantastic experience it was it was sort of in that first renaissance of the web post the uh, dot-com bust so really a lot of interesting things happening back then like web 2.0 big data cloud computing ai mobile but uh you know ottawa was a very small very small, but still a vibrant startup community. So it was a good place to, um, you know, I think, meet a lot of up and coming young entrepreneurs, and and really got to, you know, I think we were we were very close and shared a lot of lessons, learned a lot of things together. Um, some great companies came out of that. Probably the most well known being Shopify. And my transition to San Francisco was interesting. I had actually started my my second company in Ottawa called Three Hundred and Sixty PI, which was early, like early cloud big data and AI. And we actually became the market leader in a space that was called retail price intelligence with customers like Best Buy and Overstock. And um, and uh, anyway, I ended up in San Francisco by way of attending the inaugural class of Singularity University. And that was a school started by Peter Diamantis, Ray Kurzweil, Larry Page, and others. And you know, while I was there at Singularity at SU, I lived with 39 other students on the uh, on the NASA Ames base in Mountain View. And it was really from there they ended up, you know sticking around San Francisco, starting to get around with my co-founders. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, with the founding of Get Around at that time, what was the idea back then? And has it changed? Has it evolved as you went from startup to operating company to now revenue generating business on the verge of going public? How has that transitioned yeah. over time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess on the first thing, I mean, we started Get Around because, you know, you know, we, we have a world problem at the time. I think we called it car overpopulation um, just because we have way too many cars that, you know, way more cars than we need. I mean, if you add it up, we have something like 1.2 billion cars globally. And on a daily basis, we waste about 30 billion car hours. So, you know, we felt that was really inefficient. We also felt that people would share cars more often if, like many things, technology made it easier. So, what does that mean? That means if you had a fully digital experience where you could just book a car from your phone and be gone in 60 seconds, you know, if there was technology in the car, so it was connected, so you didn't have to meet someone to pick up the keys or, or arrange, you know, just getting into the car. And, and so when we looked at that, you know, we said, hey, like, we think that technology will change how people fundamentally view cars and use cars, and we should start, you know, uh, start a company doing that. Um, I don't know that I would say it has evolved, although I would definitely say it's you know we've continued to refine it over time um you know today we're still a digital marketplace based around this idea of sharing connected cars you know we had started in one small part of of, of san francisco we're much bigger today so we're global across the u.s and, and we've expanded seven countries in europe 
but probably the I, i'm just trying to think like probably the biggest evolution uh, to use that parlance has really been partnering and integrating with car companies so car companies like toyota um we're also an investor in, in get around um you know where we natively get to integrate into the vehicle so we don't actually have to you no longer have to equip cars with technology you can take advantage of all of the the richness of data and connectivity that all these new cars already have so you created this digital marketplace for sharing connected cars now my dumb question of the day why would someone want to share their car <laughs> Like, what are the main benefits in this marketplace? You have the hosts and you have the guests. What's in it for them? Well, I guess, Julian, are you saying you wouldn't want to get your car for free? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's seriously. I mean, I mean, for hosts, I mean, people share it. Um, they share their cars because they can make money, right? So you get to turn what's typically a depreciating asset most of the time, except maybe in the past couple of years, into into a money maker. So that can mean it also means you can you know justify keeping your car rather than selling it, and then of course you get the benefits of still going to use your car when you need one. Um, you know, another reason that was interesting that we've discovered over time is why people share cars is uh, um, because they want to upgrade their ride, right? They, they think, hey, I can buy a better, newer, more expensive car, and I can offset the cost of owning it uh, by sharing it with other people. And so that gets you sort of like, hey, if I really wanted that nicer car, but I couldn't justify it you know, outright, but I can because I'm actually doing good and I'm making some money at the same time, I'm going to go you know, do that. And then and probably the, the, you know, the more recent... You know, I guess evolution that we've seen to use that terminology in our marketplaces. People share cars because you know some of these users become entrepreneurs um, and they begin sharing more than one car and do that either like as a side business or um, you know their mainstay once they get big enough. And then I guess for guests, uh, so people who actually you know want to rent those cars, but if you live in a city, owning a car can be a real pain, right? And so get around really unshackles you from the hassle of ownership. And again, because it's such an easy digital experience where effectively your phone becomes like your car key. You know, we can really replace the need for, for for having to own your own car, so you can live car free or or car light, um, and then you can also get the car you want for the type of trip you're taking, right? So, like that could be an SUV for a weekend road trip, or a Prius if you're just doing some you know errands or shopping on a Saturday or whatever. And finally, an important group for us uh, and some of our users, you know, really just can't afford a car, so Get Around helps them really live and work. This podcast is brought to you by Accelerate, one of Canada's leading alternative investment solution providers. Do you want to hedge your investment portfolio and protect your nest egg from significant drawdowns? Look no further than the Accelerate Absolute Return Hedge Fund, a long-short equity ETF that trades under the ticker symbol HEDGE, H-D-G-E, on the TSX. HEDGE, your uncorrelated portfolio diversifier. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Can you talk about what some of the considerations would be for a, for a car owner in terms of car insurance when when if they're using this? Yeah, I mean, as a, the so we provide insurance. So as a car owner, you're you you can keep your personal auto insurance. Uh, most personal auto policies have an exclusion for any sort of like commercial or or rental activity. And so when you're driving your car, your policy's you know in full effect. And when you share it on Get Around, our policy comes into, into effect. And again, because we have all the data and GPS position and, and location information, we know you know when someone else is driving your car, when it's returned, and you know during that period, then our policy would would provide coverage, as well as whether you know potentially if the guest has their own coverage, then then that could also be be there as well. But um, the nice part is you don't have to worry about that as as a host share. Now, a major theme for investors these days is ESG specifically focused on environmental benefits and you know investing in companies that either don't pollute or reduce pollution and things of that nature. Now, going through your investor presentation, I noticed that car sharing does provide environmental benefits such as reduction of CO2 emissions. Can you tell us, you know, how does this work? Do you have any numbers behind that to just exemplify what sort of effect it can have? Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, I mean, the fascinating thing about car sharing is, is that households, what you find is that households that decide to go car free actually reduce their overall driving and therefore their overall, um, you know, GHG footprint by 34 to 41%. And so this is something that's actually been well studied over many years by the Sustainability and Transportation Research Center at um, UC Berkeley, where they estimate that this change in behavior means that roughly every shared car takes about 10 cars off the road. And it turns out that it's just because people are more rational in the use of cars when it's paper use. Um, you know, you don't hop in your car to drive down the street for a carton of milk. 
in that scenario. On the other hand, when you're paying five hundred thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a month for your car, you logically reason that you should drive your car to get that car built because you've already paid for the car, and so you, you know you might as well get some value for your dollar. And and so what you find is moving more and more people to living car free, living car light um, has a massive impact on the environment. And so, for example, let's say you had people sharing a million get-arounds, and those cars have the EPA average rate of emissions for a passenger car, which I think is around five metric tons per year. You know, you've got a million cars at five metric tons, each offsetting ten cars. And so you do the math at, you know, I think it's a metric ton is twenty two hundred pounds per metric ton. So you're looking at about a hundred billion pounds of CO two eliminated each year, each year for a million shared cars. Of course, a million shared cars actually isn't that many cars compared to the 250 million cars we have just in the U.S. And so you can really have, you know, you can really offset a lot of pollution we're facing today uh, by shifting people towards uh, sharing over ownership. You definitely answered my dumb question on why uh, users would want this, not just the uh, monetary benefits, but also the environmental benefits as well. Now, with respect to Getaround's business model, can you talk about how it works? I know that you describe it as asset-like, because you actually don't own the cars, you just own the technology behind it and that network. Can you describe uh, more in detail and how you guys generate revenue and, and gross margin? Yep, yep, yeah, sure. So, I mean, first get around sort of like, you can think of it as like an Airbnb for cars, but with like that technology twist. So like Airbnb, we have hosts that own and share cars, and then we have guests that rent those cars when they need them. Um, you know, that twist is really, that get around is fully digital, right? So it's powered by our proprietary connected tech. And so that means cars on get around are connected and they're communicating digitally with our cloud systems. Again, so that means, you don't, you know, you can book a car, you can walk up to it open the get around app, tap a button, unlock the doors and go. So that's really that that sort of fully digital experience. So like Airbnb, but with more advanced technology, so you don't have to meet the host or manually coordinate getting a car key. So very much you know, true asset light marketplace. And the way we make money, again, similar, uh, we have a fee that we charge on every booking that's charged to the guest. And then we take a commission from the reservation, which is charged to the host. And and that for us is you know that flows to us as what we call net marketplace value, um, and then you know the, our what generates gross margin. Our major cost is really just the cost of delivering the service, the technology, customer service, and uh, the insurance, which we spoke about earlier. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I don't know if you're planning on expanding into any other sorts of drivable. Uh, vehicles or <laughs> objects, but I could definitely use this at the lake as someone who enjoys driving a boat, but certainly doesn't want to own one. That uh, model would make sense for users there. Now, with respect to the competitive landscape for get around, what's it like for car sharing? Um, you know, what's your competitive advantage? What's the total addressable market? Yeah, yeah, great questions. I mean, car sharing's been around first for a long time, right? It's been in the U.S. since I think the year two thousand, but really started with asset heavy models like Zipcar and others, you know, but turns out it's actually really hard to scale those models and, and make money. And so today the models really evolved to be asset light marketplaces like we discussed, um, you know, like get around that are really leading the way as as the next generation. And our advantage there is, is our unique technology that creates that digital experience. Um, so don't have to meet the host, don't have to collect a car key, everything is managed digitally. And it's a big opportunity. You know, you're looking at a, a global car rental disruption, which is a $125 billion market globally. But more so than that, you're really disrupting the fabric of car ownership, right? And that's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity where as cars become more technologically enabled, you know, they have more sensors, more um, more data capabilities. You could imagine more and more people sharing cars and substituting out of car ownership, right? Which is that um, six to eight trillion dollar opportunity every year. And so, really, that's that's the the end game that we're playing for with Get Around, which is providing you a real viable alternative to buying and owning the car as, as the uh, as the addressable opportunity. Now, in terms of Get Around's future, uh, one thing I noticed in your investor presentation, working on attaining positive EBITDA margins over the next few years, what are some of the keys to success in getting to positive EBITDA? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. For us, it's really just a matter of three things. Actually, it's just continuing to grow the business as we've done for, for over a decade now. It's enhancing margins gradually by continuing to drive operational efficiencies. And then really doing that while exercising prudence over costs and expenditures. Um, and so 
those are really the three things that we're focused on to achieve, uh, you know, positive adjusted EBITDA uh, um, over the next uh, few years. And now a word from our sponsor, Accelerate, one of Canada's most innovative and fastest growing alternative investment solution providers with a suite of institutional caliber alternative ETFs for investors seeking diversification and long-term performance. The Accelerate Arbitrage Fund, symbol ARB on the TSX, is the world's first SPAC-focused ETF with a diversified portfolio of SPAC and merger arbitrage opportunities in an easy-to-use, low-cost ETF. The Accelerate Arbitrage Fund ETF trades under the symbol ARB on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Now, shifting gears a little bit, what what exactly, how, how is it working with SoftBank, uh, having them as an investor? <laughs> yeah, that's definitely shifting gears. Um, you know, in the, I'll say that, like, overall, they've been great. Um, you know, they've been very engaged, very supportive over, over multiple years. Um, you know, obviously, they're a, a large company that, you know, gets a lot, I'll say a lot of attention and flack in the media and can shift priorities very quickly. And so that can be challenging as a portfolio company to, uh, you know, be on the other side of, of a changing set of priorities and direction. And that's probably been the biggest challenge I would say is, is managing the, the, the cycles, the media cycles and all everything that goes with, with, um, you know, the pressure that's on the SoftBank corp and in, in, uh, as well as the vision fund, but, you know, in the, in the, um, the actual day to day, and you know, for us around the board as investors, they've uh, generally been uh, you know really good partners to us. Yeah, Masayoshi Sun, SoftBank, and the Vision Fund certainly get their fair share of media attention, and I'm sure that's one of the challenges that you have to face as an entrepreneur. But it's something that you've done for a very long time in terms of entrepreneurship, basically taking a company from idea to founding to building, and now taking it public, I was wondering, over all that experience, what would be some of the most significant challenges that you've had to overcome? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's been so many of them. I feel like entrepreneurship is its like a Six Flags roller coaster. You know, you get to the bottom of one slope, and then you're already staring down the barrel of, of the next one. And so um, it can be quite the ride. I would say for us, uh, with Get Around, I would say it's really the triple threat of First, when we got started, was creating a marketplace to convince Americans to share cars. Um, you know, you know, I recall like early on, we'd meet with investors, and you know, I think the response we'd get is, "Hey, I don't even share my car with my wife or my husband or whatever." <laughs> and so, like, they're like, "I'm not going to share it with some random person." Um, and so, you know, this breaking that that mindset was definitely one really big challenge. I think another was innovating around insure insure insurance before insure tech was a thing like we, we actually created one of the first sharing economy insurance policies and you know back then they're like i don't think insurance co- companies and technology companies ever talk to each other um and then building hardware you know building reliable iot tech that you would feel good about putting in someone's car especially doing that as an early stage company um you know that was certainly a real hurdle uh initially nowadays less so with the native integration partnerships the oems um but but early on for sure um and then I would say more recently, thing that's you know s- scarred in my memory is just really the COVID lockdowns, right? You know, being being a mobility company when people weren't even allowed to leave their homes, and certainly in France, you had to have a piece of paper that you gave to the police just to like you know <laughs> go like two or three miles from your house. That was definitely one of those like pull your hair out moments for for us for sure. Um, but uh, a lot of a lot of good learnings came out of that. But it's definitely a trying time. That's a really good point as a um, mobility company going through COVID. Like, what were kind of the main things you did to survive that period? I mean, we did a lot of things. I think we were making uh, like two to three to five critical decisions every day. So you had to be really fast at decision making. And, you know, as a startup, you have to be making decisions quickly, but not that quickly with, with that little information. You were basically being extremely reactive which, you know, we had to make hard calls around personnel and changes to, um, you know, focus and strategy. We put all of our effort around like the core, core business. And that meant, you know, a lot of things on the periphery, we just had to sacrifice um, maybe newer products or newer initiatives that could have borne a lot of fruit, you know, just weren't that that was not the time to be investing in, in those sort of things. Um, we refocused all of our product and engineering to work on, on, you know, 
features and enhancements that had like a 30 day payback as opposed to anything longer than that. So everything became really short term, like we're building this thing and we know it's going to, you know, it's going to be a creative within, within a month. Um, you know, we got really creative with, with, you know, financing and, and, uh, just being really, um, really sharp on every dollar we were spending and, you know, just managing through it. But, uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was certainly trying, but um, I think you know team, the team really rallied, and actually we came out of it as a stronger company. So you got through the COVID challenge. Now on to the next milestone, which is taking <laughs> get around public, emerging with yeah. interprivate two acquisition to symbol as IPVA. Once the merger completes, uh, you'll be trading under the ticker symbol GETR, I believe. Now, what are your thoughts on market conditions? Obviously. Uh, there's recession talk, there's volatile markets, rising interest rates, uh, some startup valuations declining. What are your thoughts on, you know, the whole macro picture? Yeah, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball on that, to be honest, because it would make uh, it would it would make planning that much easier. I think our view on it is, you know, I think there's still some tailwind coming out of the COVID reopening for a lot of businesses. You know, you, you are seeing still strong, some strong growth indicators around jobs and things like that. Um, you know, inflation is a real thing, but probably it's a little bit spiky and transient right now, driven by, you know, not necessarily driven by uh, pure fundamentals, but, you know, things, geopolitical things that have happened. And um, and so we're, I think we're taking a view that, um, you know, there's, there, we might be in a recession next year, but so we want to be cautious around what, how we, uh, you know, what we do and how we plan for that. Um, but that, you know, that there's the fundamentals of, the economy, technology, innovation, a lot of the disruption you've seen happen over the past 20, 30 years, that hasn't really changed and that will continue sort of unabated. And so we, you know, we can't lose, we just don't want to lose sight of the long term, you know, over the next six, 12, 18 months, but uh, just want to be, you know, very nimble as we navigate the waters uh, or navigate the roads, <laughs> you know, over the next little while. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice one. Um, so it sounds like it's move forward, but with caution. Now, with that being said, uh, last question before we let you go here. Uh, what time do you wake up in the morning on a work day? And what's your favorite productivity hack, if you have any? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, I actually don't really keep a set schedule, <laughs> which has some advantages. Like I never jet lag. People never believe that, but it's true. <laughs> which was more beneficial pre COVID, you know, and the world was less remote, but, um, so sometimes I'm up at the crack of dawn. Other times I'm actually working until the crack of dawn. So I sort of just listen to my body and figure it out. I'd say that, um, you know, productivity hacks, I do make my bed every morning because it's mm. like closes the chapter on the night's rest and you know, you, you move on. But my favorite productivity hack is probably, I don't know if it's my favorite, certainly a productivity hack is, you know, I like to plan my day the night before. So I always find that if I go to bed knowing what I'm planning to do the next day, then I wake up sort of more attuned to what needs to get done and I can go straight into flow or straight to the gym or whatever, depending on the day, but I can get right, you know, right to it without having to sort of like figure out what's what, you know, in the haze of waking up, what I'm supposed to be doing. And then I probably another one would be just, you know, having a great EA makes a world of difference. So, you know, if, if you don't have one of those, I recommend getting one, but, uh, so it's all I got top of mind right now. All right, great. Well, solid advice for our listeners. And Sam, thank you for coming on the podcast today. A lot of interesting things happening at Get Around on the verge of going public. So wish you the best of luck. And we'll be watching the story unfold. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Have a great day. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty expressed or implied is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained this podcast. Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.